Welcome everyone. It's nice to see you here. This is the spring semester General, General Revelation Institute's conference and our topic is the Great Commission. We'll be talking about the Christian's role in discipling the nations. And we've got a great schedule. If you'd like to see the schedule, you can go to generalrevelation.org. And we have the schedule for this evening and then all the talks tomorrow as well. My name is Dr. Owen Anderson, and I'm the president of the General Revelation Institute. I'd like to welcome you. We have a guest speaker here as well, Dr. Knodel. He's going to be speaking twice tomorrow on something called post-millennialism. Have you heard of that? Post-millennialism is connected to the Great Commission because the truth of the Great Commission is that it, we're going to be successful. We're actually going to disciple the nations. It's not something that's going to fail or we come short or it's just kind of a hope, but we're actually commanded by Christ to disciple the nations. Tonight, I'm going to sort of unpack some of the ideas in the Great Commission, and our theme for our conference is Habakkuk 2.14, which tells us that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord or glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Now, that's pretty deep, right? The waters cover the sea. You want to say, like, the, the bottom of the sea could get more wet. That's about as wet as it gets. So the analogy is the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God in that same way. So that's the promise of the Great Commission. Let's get into thinking about what is the Great Commission. I'll, I'll go through a couple points with you, discuss how we can know and, and what we need to do, and then we'll have some time for questions. I should mention as well that out front, there is a book table which has some books you may be interested in, and if you want to purchase one, please see James Allen. Go ahead, put your hand up, James. All right, thank you. So what is the Great Commission? I think any, anyone who's been around Christianity, been a Christian for any short amount of time, could probably tell you a little bit about the Great Commission, right? This is the last thing that Christ said to his disciples before he ascended to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, teaching them to observe all things that have been commanded. That's a lot. So notice the wording. It isn't make some disciples from every nation so that you think that you've, you've done the Great Commission if you've made two or three disciples out of each of the nations of the world. It's disciple the nations. Each nation is discipled and taught to observe all that the Lord has commanded, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one of the important Trinitarian verses, because, of course, you only baptize in the name of God. So we have that statement, and that involves us in, well, I, I don't know if you could, you could think of a bigger mission, a co-mission, right? An officer is commissioned into uh, a station. Can you think of a bigger one? given to you by Christ himself. And if you're looking for purpose in life, and I know, I hear that we live in an age of anxiety, an age where young people are feeling depression, they're feeling anxious about their life, they're not sure what to do with themselves, and, and they even have trouble with their own identity. We know that there's a great amount of identity confusion, dysmorphia in culture. Well, the Great Commission really anchors us in our identity in Christ. It gives our life focus and purpose. We know exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to disciple the nations, and, and that requires, of course, that we ourselves have been discipled. You won't be able to do that unless you've been discipled. Now, the second point here is, is getting to the very title of our institute, right? General Revelation, because I'm going to make the case that you can know from general revelation, which means Long before Christ gave the Great Commission, long before the book of Matthew was written, you could know that this was your purpose. It's a truth from general revelation. And that means not only that we can know it, but that we should have known it. When we're struggling with purpose in life, we should have been able to understand this is our purpose. 
And that involves us in truths about who God is and how God is known. But it also involves us in truths about our own condition as sinners and that we need Christ. And for, for our knowledge of Christ, then we do need to look to Scripture. We'll need to, 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 to look to uh, special revelation to understand how we're redeemed in Christ alone. But before we get there, we would know God is real and God has a purpose for us to, to know him. And we would know that, that we know God from his works. The creation around us reveals God. Have you ever heard that story of a famous atheist, Bertrand Russell, who said there wasn't enough evidence? If God ever asked him, why didn't you believe in me? He would say, not enough evidence, God. And, and the folly there is that he was presented with evidence in the creation every day of his life. The creation is temporal. It had a beginning. It didn't exist from eternity. But something is eternal. And so you could look and see, uh, use that line of thinking to see that only God is eternal. Only God has no beginning, and God created everything else. So we know these things from general relation. We know that God made us, and that feeds into the third point, that God made us as rational beings. We're distinct from the animals. We have a rational soul. We reflect on things. We want to know things. And we're very immediately aware of ourself. Right? You, don't, you don't have to be proven to yourself that you exist. You just kind of are immediately aware of yourself. And you're immediately aware of your thinking and that you want to know things. And I would even argue that you're immediately aware of your own dependence. And from there, you have the beginnings of an argument to God's existence. Not, not direct, not, not immediately. You need to do some work there, but... That's the beginning of a line of thought that would get you to God, that you're not eternal. You had a beginning. You don't keep yourself in existence. You have to eat food and drink water and breathe air every day. You're utterly dependent. And so as rational beings, we would know that our purpose is to know our creator and that we know our creator by the things that are around us in the world. We know our creator by reflecting on our own existence, our own mind. We know our creator by thinking about the moral law that guides our life. And we would know that we're supposed to fill the world with the knowledge of God. I think that's the very nature of knowledge, is that you want to share it. Have you noticed that about people who, know, when they start to know something, they, they become know-it-alls, sort of, and they want to share what they know with everybody? Yeah, that's what knowledge is like. It's kind of infectious, and you want to tell everyone, I know something. And, and that's the nature of knowing God as well. You'd want to tell people, hey, I know God. You, you should know God also. Everyone should know God. So as rational beings, our desire is for meaning. And that's why when I said a moment ago that when you hear about this age group struggling with things like purposelessness in life or struggling with anxiety, that's a very, nat that's a very human thing to struggle with. You're, you're concerned about the meaning and purpose of yourself why you're here, and, and maybe because if you've only been fed from something like secular education and culture, perhaps you've been mostly taught that you're just an animal, and you don't really have any greater purpose than fulfilling your animal desires. But as a rational being, you know, no, I, I, am, I have more to me than that, and so that juxtaposition, right, of saying there's only, there's only animal desires to be fulfilled and I'm a rational being who needs more than that, gives you that sense of anxiety, which is only so solved in the knowledge of God. Only fulfilled in the knowledge of God. So that's where we get from three to four. As a creature made by God, you would know you're supposed to know your creator, and you'd want to fill the whole world with the knowledge of God. Think about when, when someone has, say, a hobby. I was talking to Dr. Gnodal about golfing today. And you know there are people, when they get into something like golf, or I've heard there are people who do jujitsu, and they just talk about it all the time. They're fascinated by it. And that's true just for a hobby. How much the more so the knowledge of God? 
You'd want to know as much as you can about God and tell everyone you can about it. That's all you'd want to talk about. You'd want to hear from them. Maybe maybe someone else tells you, hey, I learned something also about God. Well, I want to know. Tell me about it. What is it? So as creatures made by God, we'd have that, that interest, that hope, that desire within us to, to know God and make God known. And then five, as male and female. This comes to the filling the earth part. When you had children, you and that, that requires male and female. There's some confusion about that uh, these days. I don't think you need to have a degree in biology to define male and female. And from that union, you get a child. And you'd want to teach your child things. And you don't just want to teach your child how to tie their shoes or the ABCs. You'd want to teach them the most important things there are. You want to teach them about their purpose in life, that they were created by God, that they can know God, their creator. And so the whole uh, uh, fact of having children itself reminds us that we could know just from general revelation that we'd want to have children, that they might know God, that they have children, and those children know God, and pretty soon the whole world is filled with people who know God. So you're not just filling the earth with bodies. You're filling the earth with people who know God and love their creator. So you know that as male and female. So we know those things just from general revelation alone. And you should have arguments ready at hand to show that. I've given you some indication, some kind of hint in each of these, how you would do that. And in fact, our very first conference, which is still available on our webpage, our, our YouTube channel, is about how to show those things, how to give those arguments. So we know, we know the Great Commission already. We should expect that Christ, as the one who's filling the earth with the knowledge of God, would indeed give us this commission. But what about after the fall? The things I've said to you, you could know had there never been a fall, had there never been sin. So what about after the fall? Does that change this? Well, I think it actually increases it. Because what happens with the fall is that you have a deepening of the revelation of God. God permitted the fall to deepen the revelation of his glory. And so now you would know an additional work has been given to you. The additional work given to you is the work of redemption. Now it's possible that when you have children, you have one like Cain who's an unbeliever because the fall has occurred and Cain needs to be redeemed, but he rejects that. And they have a whole line of Cain that raises up and a whole line from Seth, his brother Abel had been killed, of believers. And so now you have more work to do. You have the work that's given to you in creation and you have the work given to you in this need for redemption. So the fall doesn't change our our realization of our need to know god it increases it and increases our work both for yourself because you'll realize of yourself well i'm a sinner how will i ever be reconciled to god have you ever wondered that i hope you have i hope you've seen that as your deepest problem other problems about identity i will make the argument that other problems about gender identity or economic identity or race identity confusions about those are because you're confused about your identity as a creature of God. You were made by God, and when you're alienated from God, all other kinds of confusions come in. And pretty soon you, you, you make statements like, I need an advanced degree in biology even to know what a woman is. Because you're confused about your basic status as a creature of God. You've been alienated from God. And so the fall increases our work. Now we have the work of redemption. And now there's a war, I should say spiritual war. I, can I change that? I can't, huh? Nope. I can't. Spiritual war. And I started to hint about that with Cain and Abel, the first battle of the spiritual war in world history. But now you're involved in a spiritual war, and there's many fields of this battle, many theaters, 
of the conflict. All right, they speak that way about World War II. There's the European theater and the Pacific theater. Well, there is the theater of your own soul. You're divided. You have sin in you. And the spiritual war, that enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent goes on inside your own soul. And you have to fight that struggle. And if you're not prepared for that battle, if you don't have on the armor of God, you could very well be taken over by sin, be conquered by sin. Do you remember what that's exactly what God said to Cain? Sin looks to master you. But then there is the, this conflict that exists between people as well, within yourself, between people. And that comes out at the, the relational level between two people. Think about, about breaks you've had with friends, perhaps, or in marriages, divisions that come up, long-standing fights, or maybe even divorce. But it also occurs between groups of people, groups of people that can hardly talk to each other anymore because they're in conflict. Well, that's all traceable back to this spiritual conflict. A lot of times it manifests maybe at an economic level and you have economic envy or coveting between groups. But that's traceable back to discontent before God and, and alienation from God. And then at the, at the largest level, you have the spiritual war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And that's what your attention is drawn to by our Lord when he gives you this commission. You're commissioned into this battle, and it's at the largest level possible. It's bigger than anything Marvel or Tolkien ever imagined. It's a cosmic struggle, and, and you're part of that. You'll, you'll definitely be on one side or the other. There's no neutral side. You're on one side or the other of this great spiritual war. And you're being discipled by one of the other sides. You're a disciple either of the city of man, the city of darkness, or you're a disciple of the city of God. Now, what's interesting about the city of man is one of the ways the city of darkness makes disciples is keeping you in ignorance of the fact that you're even a citizen there. So if you're not sure which city you're in, that's probably a good indicator you're in the city of darkness. And you're being discipled by the city of darkness. You use a subterfuge, subtlety, to keep you in captivity. Whereas if you are in the city of God, you'll know it because you, you confess Christ as your Savior and you're, you're involved in discipling the nations. So that's the battle, and that's what the Great Commission is asking from each of us. I, I don't know that you can get into a, a bigger or greater purpose than that. You've ever struggled with your purpose in living, your purpose for your life? The answer will always bring you back, as a Christian, to the Great Commission. Fill in the earth with an knowledge of God. You begin with knowing God through all of his works, both his works of creation and his work in redemption. You know that, and you then make disciples of others. Now, I see this slide's a little different than I had it earlier, just in terms of the spacing here. The Great Commission after the fall. I'm going to go into more detail now about that last point, six and seven. The fall and the work of redemption. The fall was about your knowledge of God. Do you remember that's how the temptation began? Did God really say? Did God really say? So it's, the temptations are always the same, to get you to doubt the Word of God. And then from there, to insert yourself as God. Now, no, people have used that language. People have said, I'm a God. In fact, uh, talk show hosts say that. You're divine, right? There's something divine in us. But... Uh, Usually it's a little more subtle than that. It'll be more like, I get to decide for myself. I'm my highest authority. And that's really what we face here is a crisis of authority. 
who is the authority to what do you look for authority. And our culture currently teaches, and, and this really has been true all the way back to the fall, that you determine what is good for yourself. So we're even at a point now where, where you can determine your gender. You can determine truths like that about yourself. They're not set by God. You are your own God. You determine good and evil for yourself. That's the original temptation, and it's a temptation that we still deal with. Now, plunged into the death that comes from sin, because that was the consequence, right? The day you eat, you'll surely die. Plunged into that spiritual death, what hope is there that you'd ever be forgiven? What hope is there that you would ever have that relationship with God restored? That that alienation you had with God would be restored. Well, we have that hope promised also from the very beginning. You remember in the story that Adam and Eve were covered with animal skins. Now, animals don't ordinarily continue living when you take their skins, which is to say this is the first sacrifice. Something died so they could be covered. And so they're taught from the very beginning the truth of vicarious atonement that through the death of another, they would be covered. But then they're driven out of the garden. Have you ever wondered what they're driven in? A golf cart. They're driven out of the garden to live under the curse that God pronounced, toil, suffering, and eventually death. And living under the curse is going to sanctify them. It's going to produce the sanctification needed to become more and more like Christ. So we have those truths with the fall. We also have the truths of justification and sanctification given to us. And the promise and the hope from the very beginning that there would be vicarious atonement for sin. And that sets up the spiritual war. I'll put enmity between your seed and his, the seed of the woman, Notice it says from the very beginning, the seed of the woman, not the seed of the man and the woman. Earlier I talked about male and female, and I mentioned this is how you have children. And here we have a promise of one who would be the seed of the woman alone, not in the line of Adam. And the seed of the woman will be at enmity with a serpent, and the serpent will strike his heel, and he will crush its head. So you have this spiritual battle promised, and that's a good thing. Have you ever thought about that? That it's good to be at enmity with Satan? Like, would you want to get Christmas cards from Satan every year? Like, you're on his friend list? Oh, yeah. Satan and I, we're good friends. We catch up when, when he's in town. No, you want to be at war with Satan, right? You want to say, oh, he snubbed me again this year for a Christmas present. So it's very good that from the beginning, that enmity, that warfare was introduced. We won't continue down the path we started on as humans. We'll be restored. But it's going to be an age-long battle. A promise of the future seed of the woman. And then, even then, the seed of the woman will be riding out to conquer the world, which takes more time. And so we're caught up in that, and that gives us a sense of time in our lives. Our lives can be reflected on as where they fit within that spiritual battle, that spiritual war. Post-Christ, for example, for us, right? We're not like Abraham living before Christ. We're post-Christ. We're also post the age of exploration, post the age of nations, or, or living right at the, towards the end of that. The world wars were the wars between these global nations. And then the Cold War that brought out the conflict with Marxist religion, which continues to try to dominate the world and continues to try to capture the minds of Americans. And so that's where we're at in a spiritual battle. It's different than when the missionary age first began. We're no longer at that age. We're in an age now where missionaries have gone into the nations. That doesn't mean we've discipled them, though. And so our work will be a little different where we're dealing with people who may have heard of Christianity, very large percentage uh, chance that they've heard of Christianity and probably don't understand what it says. They probably misunderstand it. So if you're doing missionary work, that's probably this, the kind of thing you're stepping into. The same with, 
with evangelization in a place that already had lots of Christians like the United States. Most people say, oh yeah, I know what Christians teach, and then they're, they're wrong about things. And so your job will be to say, no, I don't think you do know what they teach. I don't think you know how to solve your own problem. Your problem, your anxiety, your depression, your emptiness in life is due to the fact that you're alienated from God. And you have no idea of how to be restored to God, your creator. Because you can't do it yourself. So we can know where we fit in in that age-long battle. And it is agonizing. I put that up there because it mentions that his heel will be struck. Christ went through agony to where he was sweating great drops of blood. And he tells his followers to expect the same. They'll be persecuted, sometimes even unto death. But you won't get out of it without being persecuted. So you expect that going into it, and that's true of the different uh, theaters of the battle I mentioned. It'll be agonized within yourself because there will be a sense in which you love sin, and you really don't want to give it up. And so you'll struggle with yourself knowing that this is sin, but I don't have the power to give it up. That's what you'll need the Holy Spirit for, for the life of God that gives you the power to overcome sin. So that's agonizing. Many people spend, spend time struggling with that internal battle with sin. But it's true also between people. The very first family feud was so violent it led to murder between brothers. And, and families have been fighting ever since. And it's agonizing to people. Parents that can't talk to their children, children that can't talk to their parents. Married couples that break up. It's very agonizing, and that's also true in war, as nations go to war with each other. So you have this battle that's going on throughout history. As you look at history, what lens do you study it through? Well, you study it through this lens of the Great Commission that was there from the beginning. You study it through the lens of we're to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. You don't study it through the lens of decolonization, of post-capitalist Marxism, of gender dysphoria. You study it through the lens of the Great Commission, the work that was given to humanity to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. And of course, the city of darkness has its own lens that it wants to impose on you to say, no, that's not how you study history. You study history as the 1% of the 1% take all the capital and oppress everyone else. And they'll try to impose their philosophy of history on you. But that's not correct. And that's really what we're doing here is we're getting a philosophy of history and a philosophy of our purpose in life. And it comes back to the Great Commission. Now what happens in world history is God allows all views to come to expression. And you can think back if you know much about the history of ideas, and you'll see how views like pantheism, there have been cultures that taught that everything is God. And they've been permitted by God in his history to develop themselves. How does that work out for you? Does that lead you to life or to death? There's been polytheistic views. There's been atheistic, materialistic views. There have been views that say they believe in God, but they really believe God exists alongside of the world, which is also eternal. The Greek view, which early Christianity had a lot of interaction with. So part of God's providence is that God rules in the world to, to allow all these views to come to expression and reveal that sin always leads to death. No one can say God was not long-suffering. No one can say, well, if God just would have let this view, whichever one it is, uh, have its time, it would have shown that we can get to life without God. At this point in history, you can pretty well say it's been tried. Right? You could have someone come along and say, no, I have a new one. Say, no, that's just the old one. You gave it some new names, some new words, but it's already been tried and it led to death. It led to spiritual and cultural collapse. It didn't lead to life. And that's what's really happening in our own nation as we're involved in very sharp culture wars between the city of darkness and the city of God. More and more obvious as time goes on. And the war of the atheistic Marxism to take over the mind of the Christians. You'll have to be on one side or the other. You'll be you will be on one side or the other. 
So we have this coming to these views coming to expression in world history, and the purpose there is that it deepens the revelation of God. Again, going back to the Westminster Confession of Faith, God permitted the fall to deepen the revelation of his glory. It deepens our knowledge of God to see, because we might say we believe it, but unless we see it worked out, we won't really believe that sin leads to death. Have you ever been told something by your parents, younger persons? And they say, if you do this, it will lead to problems in your life. And you're kind of like, eh. They don't know what they're talking about. I'll be the one person that does this and it doesn't lead to death. Right? And it always does. They're right. And that's how it works out in world history as well. We say, well, if we had just tried taking all the rich people's money and absorbing it and giving it back to the poor, we would have had life. Oh, no, that was tried. Actually, it, it failed. What if we give out food to everybody, no matter if they work or not? Have you heard about that at Jamestown? That was the first attempt at Jamestown. Everyone gets the same amount of food every day, no matter what you do. What do you think people did with their time? Worked or didn't work? No one worked. And so they had to change it up and say, you get food for your work. So a lot of what we're going to find out is this is an attempt to avoid the very work that God gave us from the beginning. The promise is this. This is the promise in the garden. You can have life without the work God assigned you to have. And think of how many people today want to become wealthy without doing work. They want to avoid work. And work has been changed. There's an original work, which is not toil. Not all work is toil. But after the fall, there's the addition of toil in our work. You'll eat by the sweat of your brow. And so part of sin is to say, I don't want to do it God's way. I can have wealth and never have to work again. And have life that way. And that's part of what the Marxists are objecting to. Is living off of other people's labor. And that is an unbiblical view. Each is to labor. Even when you had the fields. And you didn't glean the corners. To leave those for the poor. They had to go out and harvest the food themselves. Everybody got that food by working. So the spiritual war deepens revelation of God and deepens our knowledge of God. Now, third point, I wonder if you believe that good will overcome evil. One of the things we're going to talk about tomorrow, what Dr. Kenoto will be telling us about, is a view called post-millennialism. Not post-Malone. That's a, a popular singer that I know James is, likes a lot. But post-millennialism. This teaches us that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God, that Christ rides out, conquers the world, and he rules from the right hand of God the Father until all of his enemies have been made his footstool. Now, I was raised in a very different view. I was raised with the view that everything is getting worse and worse. And it's going to get so bad that Christianity will be almost extinguished on the earth. I had a sixth grade teacher tell me that that they have a supercomputer. It's, it's so smart, it takes up a room this size, because it was a long time ago when I thought the bigger a computer was, the smarter it was. It's a huge supercomputer, and it's going to name, it's going to have a list of all the Christians and exterminate them. And just at the last moment, when only Kirk Cameron is left, Jesus returns. Have you heard of that view? Some form of pre-mill dispensationalism. There are different views of it. But I think we can know that good overcomes evil. I think we can know that from general revelation, just from the nature of God. If God is sovereign, God doesn't lose. God is sovereign. God is perfect in power, perfect in goodness, perfect in knowledge. So God knows what's happening and is acting in all things so that good overcomes evil. 
If you already know who God is, you would never struggle with his idea that evil wins. Of course it doesn't. You'd know it from the nature of man. That man need meaning. We can't live without meaning, and we can only have meaning through the logos. Any other attempt will leave us in emptiness. So it's not like something such as baseball. I like baseball. I think it's a really fun sport. I like jujitsu. I think it's fun. I like chess. But it's conceivable that culture moves on and no one does those things anymore. That in, they're not inherent or necessary to human nature. But meaning isn't like that. That's why I love studying world history and world cultures. I love to find out how did the Mayans make sense of life? If I was, a, if I was looking for chess, I might find some game they play that's similar like chess. But I wouldn't find what we do is chess. But I'm definitely going to find, when I look into the Mayans, how they tried to find meaning. How about the Mongolians? I just finished a great book about Chinggis Khan. And he's a fascinating character. Top 10 fascinating characters, I'd say. And he believed he was anointed by God to conquer the world. He found meaning in that purpose. And that made him a general unlike any other you've seen. So he sought meaning. So the nature of man is such that humans want meaning. If you were to remove meaning from their life, they'd rather die. Right? And then for the nature of the good. The good is a phrase or a word that means our highest purpose. Our highest purpose is to know God. And as I said earlier, knowledge is infectious. You share it. It's one of the few things that the more you share, the more there is. The other thing like that's a negative thing, diseases, right? You have a disease, you cough on somebody, now they have it. You shared it. But knowledge is like that, right? If I know something and I share it with you, it doesn't decrease, it increases. And so the knowledge of God is like that. And God's purpose is to fill the whole earth with the knowledge of God. So you combine from the nature of God, from the nature of man, the nature of the good, and you'll see that far from the, the uh, failure to know God increasing, the knowledge of God will increase. So that's in contrast to having false hope. False hope. So think about the view that I said earlier. It says that the church completely fails at the Great Commission. I don't mean like they have a couple of bad years or a couple of bad quarters they have to report on earnings. They utterly fail at the Great Commission. And then Christ returns. So that when Christ said, go do this, he knew, thought you're going to fail really badly. That's not how it works. So the, the false hope there is that you'll have the millennium, it's called premillennialism, Christ returns before the millennium. You'll have the benefits of the millennium without ever doing any work. You fail. Do you see how it comes back to work and your purpose in life? I don't have to work. I don't have to disciple the nations. It's a fool's errand anyway. No one's going to do it. The nations will reject Christianity and destroy Christianity. Well, that's a false hope then, to think that somehow you'll get the highest good without the work of discipling the nations. Now I also have point five, which got cut off there, against no hope. So I have against false hope, but it's also against no hope. There's a view that says the city of darkness and the city of God continue parallel together and neither conquers the other. Perhaps in some ages one expands, the other decreases. In another age this one expands, this one decreases. But there's no final victory in history. The victory is only when history ends and Christ returns. Well, that's no hope then. Your work has no hope. And if you don't have hope, do you have any purpose in doing it? If you were told by your employer they will pay you at the end of infinity, would you have any hope in your work? I can't wait till I get to the end of infinity. If, you, if, that, if that seems plausible to you, see me afterwards. We'll talk about what infinity means. There'd be no hope in your work. There'd be no purpose to it, therefore. So those go together, don't they? 
If there's no hope the Great Commission can be fulfilled, there's no purpose to work at it. And in fact, you'll see that when people think there's no hope, they don't work at the Great Commission. They're not actively involved in discipling nations. You've had many Christians like that. Now, what's the history been so far? History of humans refusing to keep this command. This command was with us from the very beginning. The first great commission, I've said that it's there in general revelation, but God gave it to humans in special revelation right at the beginning and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill in the earth. That be fruitful and multiply, having dominion. The be fruitful and multiply is not just you have a bunch of kids because what if they're all like Cain? Now the, the command was given before the fall, but it continues after the fall. So you're filling the earth with persons who know God and who also keep the command. It can't be done by just one couple. Two people won't have enough kids for that. It's going to take all humans working together. And so the very first iteration of the, the uh, Great Commission is that one given in Genesis chapter 1. Be fruitful, multiply. Having dominion over the world. Teach your children to know God. And that would give them a cultural mandate because they're developing all areas of culture as they have dominion. All that's pre-fall, which is why I first already talked about does the fall interrupt that? No, it doesn't. It increases it. But Adam and Eve refused to keep it. I can get wisdom just by eating this fruit. I don't have to keep the command of God. And in doing that, they're putting themselves in the place of God. I learned something today really interesting from a Taiwanese friend about the Chinese Marxists that is actually in their constitution, and I'm going to have a podcast about this next week, that the, that the people are divine. And I kind of went back and forth to make sure. Do you mean, do you mean like a special? No, I mean it's the word for divine. So they said, rather than saying like the emperor is divine, like you've had before, the communists, of course, say the people themselves are God. They're sacred. They're divine. That's one of the ways that they lay claim on Taiwan. That's part of our sacred land and our sacred people. You can be God. You're divine. That's from the very beginning. That's a temptation from the very beginning. The fruit will give you wisdom. Now we know, I already covered Adam and Eve and the repentance. The repentance comes in this. If you read carefully, there's no line that says, and then Adam repented. But do you know what it says immediately after God pronounces the curse? What does Adam do? I think the natural thing would be to say, I'm done. I don't ever want to talk to you or you, even God, again. I have a piece of chalk. I'm going to draw a line down the garden, a la I love Lucy. I'll stay on my side of the line. You stay on your side of the line. That'd be a very natural response, wouldn't it? That's not what Adam does. Adam says, I name the woman Eve because she'll be the mother of all living. He commits himself to the command to be fruitful and multiply. That's repentance. Repentance isn't just, oh, my bad. Let me keep doing what I'm doing. Repentance means I recognize what I did wrong and I begin to do what is right. So Adam sinned, but he's also our model for repentance. Not so with number two. Remember the curse to Eve was pain in childbearing. And whenever I cover that with students, they, they always ask the same physiological questions. How can that not be painful? Like, well, maybe it could have been like a pod, like, like a, a baby starts growing out of you, and then when it gets to the size, it falls off and keeps growing like some plants do or something. No, I, I don't know. The doctor in the room is shaking his head, no. You divide in half like a slug, maybe like part of you falls off and there's a second person. No, you made male and female. You have babies. I think the pain is much greater than just what happens at the hospital. Your children will be sinners and in being rebellion against God. What parent would want that for their children? But that's the reality that unless they're redeemed by God, unless your child is given a new heart, there'll be a war with God and nothing you do as a parent 
can give them a new heart. You could put them right there and you could have, have Bible being read 24-7 at the little kid for his whole life. He'll probably reject God even more because it's such a terrible teaching method. You can't do anything about it. It's completely up to the Holy Spirit. That's pain and childbearing and Cain bears that out. Sin wants to have mastery over him. I have, a, I have a lecture on my YouTube channel going over how many times God was patient with Cain. How many times Cain was given an opportunity to repent the way Adam did. And each time he hardens himself to the point of murdering and then to the point of lying to God. And then we have uh, one of his descendants, Lamech, who came up with a brilliant idea. He was an inventor. And he, he invented polygamy. Would you like to be known for an invention? Would you invent Apple phone? Would you invent uh, electric car? Would you invent polygamy? Wow, that's great. So it done such good things for humans. Well, he reasoned. He, he had a rational soul. One wife's pretty good. Two wives, therefore, would be even better. Why is that mentioned? There were lots of sins. Lamech wasn't the only sin because it's a direct violation of what God had just made in marriage and how God has said, be fruitful, multiply. You might reason, well, if I get lots of people, lots of women going on having kids, we'll, we'll do this a little faster. Right? But that's not how God commanded it. So again, he's trying to avoid the command of God, breaks the command of God, and the entire line of Cain is plunged into unbelief and spiritual death. So that then you get the line of Seth. And you think, oh good, maybe Seth is the one that will break through for everybody. Perhaps he's the promised child. And the line of Seth utterly fails to keep his command. And for a very same reason that Eve did. Eve looked and saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye. It was a good looking fruit. I'm always, I don't know what that look means, like different fruits, like a pear looks better than a dragon fruit. I don't know. But this one was a really good looking fruit. Well, the sons of Seth, the believers, looked and saw that the daughters of men, the unbelieving women, were beautiful. And they intermarried, and the entire distinction between believers and unbelievers was threatened to the point where the whole world was filled with unbelief and the violence and wickedness that comes from it. And it's still true today. Many times you'll find that with, with people getting married. They just want to find what they consider to be an attractive spouse, and they'll make all kinds of compromises in the area of belief to get what they think is an attractive spouse. So they're good sons of Seth still. But that led to this point where the whole world was flooded with unbelief, and so you know the story of the flood after that. Point four, Babel. The flood had happened, and the reasoning is, we'll stay united, don't fill the whole world. Stay united under one ruler who will be like a god to us. And so God forced them to fill the whole earth by dividing the language. And that's really where human history begins, isn't it? When you start getting into human history, usually you're studying the history of nations or people groups. You're studying the history of warfare. And, and that's what starts after Babel. That was another attempt to not keep this command. How about the city of Ur? Abraham can't stay in Ur. Why not? He could do evangelism. I'd love to hear our last, our last conference was about the school of Abraham. Because I made some conjectures about what arguments he would use to know God. I'd love to have been in the school of Abraham and the arguments he gave against the Urians or Urites. How did the Iranians? They are moon worshippers, which always struck me as odd. Also, but there's the sun. Yeah, but we really like the moon. The sun is really bright, though, right? Like, completely destroys the moon. Yeah, the moon's pretty good, though. So they worship the moon, and Abraham had to leave. The distinction between belief, the city of God, and the city of darkness, and so the history of redemption begins with Abraham then, doesn't it? And the children of faith that come all the way down to us now, Christians, who 
who are children of Abraham, having the same faith. That was the beginning of the work of redemption in human history to where from Abraham's time, the promise to him was, through you, all nations will be blessed. Do you hear that? Habakkuk 2.14. What's the blessing? It's to know God. Through the truths taught to Abraham, the whole world will come to know God. And then we know the story of Egypt and Israel. Egypt and Babylon represent that city of darkness, and Egypt enslaves the Israelites. And yet it's totally destroyed. And see the long suffering of God with Egypt. Coming to Pharaoh time and again, and Pharaoh could repent at any one of those times. And a few of them he did, and then immediately takes it back. But God is long suffering. So you think of the 10 plagues, don't think of that as, wow, 10 things to destroy Pharaoh. No, they were 10 times to say, Pharaoh, wake up, repent. What are you doing? And he hardened his heart. And Egypt is destroyed. Israel is established to go into the promised land and be fruitful and multiply there. And then we have in point seven, the four beasts of Daniel or the seven heads of the beast in Revelation. These are the nations that have risen up and fought against the people of God. And they're the nations that will be destroyed by destroyed, it doesn't simply mean a physical sense where they no longer are there, right? There's no Egypt now. You would, there is a country called Egypt, but it's not the Egyptians from Moses' time. And when you go to see their stuff, it's just old pyramids, right? Dusty pyramids. It's not just that. They're destroyed in the sense that they're made gods. They're made into gods, people, not that are made divine. They're converted. They're discipled. And the whole world is discipled, all of the nations, all of those peoples who were scattered at the time of Babel come to bring their treasures to the Lord and worship the Lord. And that's what it means to say that Christ is ruling at the right hand of God the Father until he's made all of his enemies his footstool. Not the Christians are destroyed and then he returns to save them. He's ruling and his enemies are made as footstool. He rules over the nations, and they're converted. So what is true hope? I told you already about false hope, and I told you about no hope. Let's end the night with true hope. Would you like that? What I should say now is that this section of the lecture costs nineteen ninety nine, right? So if you want the true hope part, Go to my Patreon account and say, but what I want, we'll just give it, we'll just hand this out. See, if I know something, I just want to tell everyone about it. Well, we've talked about this already, that good overcomes evil. The knowledge of God overcomes, and that includes in the beginning, before the fall, but it also includes after the fall. Redemption will spread to fill the whole world. And I think that's completely contrary to the popular eschatology at the local Christian bookstore or on TBN. And so I'd like to hear from you. You might think this, this is impossible. You might point around. You might say, look, look around you. Look at how bad things are. And I, I think things are, are colossally bad. And yet I have true hope every day. Colossally bad as we teeter on the Marxist revolution that will take over the mind of the United States. And perhaps it will be successful. The vast majority of university professors, I'm one of them, teach the Marxist religion to captive audiences every day at state universities and in public schools. So a revolution is going on right now, and it might be that they're successful. And yet that's still consistent with true hope. Because it doesn't promise that any individual group will be successful. It promises that the city of God will be successful. And if a nation turns away from God, it's permitted to go into the darkness of death. But that also reveals who God is. Nothing can stop that. And so is it, if this is a day like Elijah's, well, that's a glorious day. Remember Leonidas? You'll have a great story to tell. 
And isn't the story with the 300 priests of Baal a great story to tell? Would it be the same if it was like 300 Elijahs and one priest of Baal? So, it might be like the stock market, right? We see like back to 1900 up to the present, it's, it's, it's certainly increasing, but you can zero in on any one point and it's been a major recession for 10 years. You could have a major recession for 100 years, for 200 years, but the overall trajectory is good. So you can't point to evidence to say, look how bad things are. I'll point to the same evidence to say, look at how they reveal who God is. A nation went into sin and it led to death. That's what God said would happen. What would be troubling is if you pointed out a nation that went into sin and they achieved life. Then you say, what? But it's not troubling at all to see if one goes into sin and they lead to death. And that really gets into the next point about world history. I'm, I was talking about the present. But this is true if you look at any point in world history. Nations that turn to sin stumble and fall into death every time. The wages of sin is death, and God's word is always proven true. So world history is one of increased hope. Think about back to the time of Abraham. Abraham and Sarah, with no children, leave Ur. Two people not even yet having children, and perhaps from their perspective they never will. You don't live in such a time. You live in such a time where roughly half the world to some extent identifies as Christian. And that's billions of people. That's a lot, right? That's not the time of Noah or the time of Abraham. It's not even the time of Elijah. It's not the time of Christ. So the Christ has been riding out and conquering and that work is being done, but there's more work to do. If you told me we've done everything and this is what all we've got so far, then I'd lose hope. But we haven't done everything. There's much more to do. And this is being accomplished through the work of the Great Commission. When the Marxist religion critiques history, they keep it at the level of economics. And so they'll talk about decolonizing and colonization was an economic strategy of how to rule over other places in order to get their goods and resell them and manufacture them. Never let that be confused with the Great Commission. There were also missionaries going out. And those aren't the same thing. But a lot of the, the, the push is to also de-Christianize. And they do it by linking Christianity with purely economic history. But the truth is that after the Reformation, missionaries have taken... Christianity to the ends of the world. So you have faithful believers, perhaps more faithful than you'll find in the United States, throughout the world. That's the work of the Great Commission so far. It's as if you're getting a battle report. How are we doing? Well, we've taken major places, but we're, we're under siege in some other places. And you need to be ready for that battle. Are you organizing your life to be ready for that battle? Time and again, Christ says, watch. Are you watching? Are you watching over yourself that sin doesn't master you? Or are you like a boat whose anchor has been cut, and, and you may not know it's been cut, and if you just look at the boat, and you look at the water around the boat, nothing seems to be changing. But as the tide moves the boat, and you look at the shore, you realize I'm far, far from where I started. I wasn't being watchful, and sin had me. I was sleeping through life, and that's true for many Christians. Not paying attention, they're not watching themselves, let alone are you watching culture? Do you know the signs of the times you live in? Do you know the major battles being fought? Or are you hardly even aware of them? Do you know why the vast majority of professors are Marxists? When a hundred years ago they would have been Christians, what happened? How was that territory lost? What will it take to regain it? True hope builds on the foundation. I've heard people speak this way in all areas of life. Financial areas of life, you need the foundation, a good financial foundation. 
athletic areas of life? Do you have a good foundation for physical health? So it's a common analogy to a building where you want a slab of cement, a heavy rock, something that won't move, on which you build. And that's true for Christians also. And the foundation is that it's clear that God exists. God's eternal power and divine nature are revealed to you in the things that God has made. It's clear that God rules history. That's God's providence. Point four up there. Not just that God created in the distant past, God actively rules. Can you see God's rule in the nations right now? That God brings a curse on the nation as a judgment to call his people to repent and turn to him? Do you see how he rules in your life through the same process? So that you should be able to see not only the clarity of God's existence, but the clarity of God's providence and the clarity of God's moral law. God gave you a law that describes how to achieve the good. It's the means, it's the path on which you walk. Do you know the law of God? And can you explain it to others? These are the three things involved that you'd have to know if you are going to disciple the nations. If you don't know these things, you can't disciple anybody. Have you been discipled? Are you in a church where you can be discipled? Are you in a church that's teaching you how to disciple the nations? You need to be. And then five, Send up to baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the battle against evil, we see all three persons of the Trinity involved in this fight. All three persons of the Trinity are revealed to us. As the Father so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Sometimes God is thought of as vindictive or angry or out to get you. He's sort of just watching you to see if you mess up. And then when you mess up, he says, gotcha. Sort of like a, uh, a, stero- a Santa Claus on steroids, an omnipotent Santa Claus. But that's not what John 3.16 tells us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And do you see what Christ did? I mentioned earlier already the agony in the garden, praying, if there is some other way, let this pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Perfect revelation of the Messiah. And you see what Christ suffered for that redemption on the cross. To be praying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The eternal Son of God, praying that prayer. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This is the message that the nations need. And in that same chapter of John, we're told by Jesus of the Spirit. Did you know that the Spirit goes where he pleases? I hear word of revival in the land. Have you heard of it? I'm waiting to hear more. But I hear talk of revival. Does that get you excited? Maybe you haven't heard of it. That's what I said earlier about sleeping through life. Could there be a revival in our day? Do you pray for revival at Arizona Christian University? Could you pray for a revival at Arizona State University? Could the sun devils be revived, be brought back to life? I think they could. What if there's a revival in the land? That's the work of the Holy Spirit giving a new heart, making the dead come back to life. Your culture loves zombie stories. I keep thinking that we're going to get to the end of this terrible season and they make another one. Zombies aren't reanimated. You're coming back to life. You're actually restored to life, regenerated, revived. Do you pray for that in your culture? Make that your prayer. Get involved in the Great Commission. Your Lord and Savior gave you that commission, and that organizes your entire life. This is what we'll be learning about all day tomorrow also. I hope you'll join us. 